Hello, I'm Michael Howe, the incoming president of the RUSI. And uh, without knowing what time of the day you're going to be viewing this, I just wish you all the very best and thank you for tuning in. It's my privilege and honour to introduce this year's Sir Herman Black Year in Review lecturer. And it is a person that we've had before uh, lecturing to the RUSI. And I'd particularly like to welcome and thank uh, Hervé Lamahieu, who is the Director of Policy and Power Programs at the Lowy Institute. The best way of finding out about uh, Hervé is I would recommend go to the website and have a look. And if you do, and I did that a few minutes ago, uh, I've simply printed that you will see a photograph of Hervé. Uh, it will give you his publications and his history and background. And so I would also want to acknowledge he's a very distinguished researcher and a very significant commentator uh, on uh, defence-related activities. I'd like to very briefly mention why we call it the Sir Herman Black Lecture. Uh, Sir Herman Black was a member of the AUSI. Uh, he was Sir Herman Black, uh, AC, and he was the Chancellor of the University of Sydney. I'll just check my dates are accurate. From uh, 1969, when he was appointed, to 1990, which was also the year that very unfortunately uh, he died. So he had a very long tenure as the Chancellor of the University of Sydney. And he was a member of the RUSI, and each December, he would personally deliver what he called the Year in Review, which for RUSI members was a very powerful overview of how Sir Herman saw the significant events of that particular year. And we have continued to honour Sir Herman by continuing to have the Sir Herman Black Year in Review in December each year. I got up on YouTube just a, an hour or so ago and had a look at the, at the 2019 Sir Herman Black Review, and it was delivered by Andrew Green, the ABC defence commentator. And there's a segue into the challenging task that uh, Hervé has accepted, and, and we're delighted that he has. It's just fascinating to have uh, a, an overview of how the world looked in December 2019 prior to COVID, prior to the enormous changes that we've clearly experienced in this very challenging and very difficult year. So on behalf of all of the members of the AUSI and uh, as president, I'm particularly proud to thank and welcome Hervé, and I would now invite him to deliver the Sir Herman Black Year in Review 2022. Over to you, Hervé, and thank you very much. Hello, my name is Hervé Lamieux, and I'm the director of the Power and Diplomacy Program at the Lowy Institute in Sydney. The Royal United Services Institute of New South Wales has long been committed to promoting Australia's national security. So it's a, a pleasure and a real privilege to be with you again, albeit remotely from the office, to deliver the 2020 Sir Herman Black Year in Review lecture. It's hard to know where to begin with this one, and suffice to say it's a bewildering time to have to try to make sense of the world. There's a quote often attributed to Vladimir Lenin, which goes, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And that phrase appears particularly resonant to me looking back at 2020. It's been a year that's been memorable for all the wrong reasons. And in the broadest possible terms, governments and societies, almost without exception, faced a perfect storm of public health, economic and strategic challenges in ways few could have imagined a year prior. So in reviewing the year, I don't wish to provide an exhaustive account of everything that took place. Rather, I'd like to focus on three key challenges that came to a head in 2020 with the greatest bearing on Australia's security and prosperity. Australia's crisis year was dominated by three Cs. There was climate change, there was COVID-19, and of course there was China, whose, whose ire we bore the brunt of. Now, all three of these challenges are non-traditional security threats, you could argue, but nevertheless, um, the way in which we respond to them will set the terms of our future security and prosperity. 
we now have to navigate a world that in the words of the prime minister has become poorer, more dangerous and more disorderly. In January, Australia was devastated by bushfires, a grim reminder of the challenges presented by climate change. At the same time, a new and deadly virus, COVID-19, was spreading from Wuhan to the rest of the world. And amid the global pandemic, our relations with our most important economic partner deteriorated to their lowest point since Australia's establishment of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China in 1972. So without further ado, let me begin by jogging your memory, going back to the bushfire crisis that ripped through the country in early 2020. As we marked Australia Day in the smog, few could dispute that the lucky country was looking decidedly less lucky. In fact, we have a good claim to being the advanced economy most ravaged by climate change in 2020. And our global image took a big hit. Pictures were broadcast across the world of blue skies turned blood red, of world-class beaches converted into evacuation zones, and of eucalyptus forests transformed into killing fields for millions of native animals. The outpouring of global sympathy, of international solidarity, reflected the fact that in the eyes of the world, this disaster struck at the heart of the Australian way of life. The American dream is fueled by the innovation of Silicon Valley. The Chinese dream is about lifting millions out of poverty. But Australians can boast of a unique relationship between their quality of life and the nature that surrounds us. That is the Australian dream. And that soft power helps fuel the success of our tourism industry, our agricultural exports, our foreign policy, and even you could argue our demographic destiny as we seek to attract the world's best and brightest to immigrate to our shores. In short, the environment, the beauty of Australia goes to the heart of our global identity and appeal. The damage done by the bushfire crisis was not simply to our environment, however, it was also to our reputation as a middle power with global sensibilities. The, inter the international media, you'll remember, was quick to make the link between the bushfires and our domestic rancor on climate policy. Whether we liked it or not, the cat was out of the bag. And it brought home the point that our visibility as a nation globally is far larger than our 1.3% contribution to global emissions. In fact, the greatest self-deception has come in allowing ourselves to think of Australia as a spectator, when in fact we are a central player in the world's most pressing long-term crisis. We sometimes hear the argument that actions from individual countries such as ours will on their own make little difference to global warming. But if all countries, that individually produce less than 2% of global emissions said they were too small to do anything, a third of the world's greenhouse gas emissions would go unchecked. And that's why we have global agreements. And this is also where the US election results may well, may well create the greatest ramifications for Australia's foreign policy. The incoming Biden administration has pledged to rejoin the Paris Agreement and has called on world leaders to make ambitious, more ambitious national pledges. The debate on climate change has moved fast in the last few months of 2020 and is about to get faster. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the next conference of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26, which is set to take place in Glasgow in the UK, will be one of the most important international summits in history. And when you look at where all our major trading and strategic partners are going, the US, the UK, the EU, Japan, South Korea, and even China, all have now committed to net zero carbon targets. Net zero emissions by 2050, not so long ago seen as a radical proposition, has now become the entrenched middle ground or centrist stance in global climate discussions in 2020. So where is Australia in this debate? Notably absent, but there are signs that Canberra is recognizing it can no longer be such an outlier. Short termism on climate policy, apart from anything else, has the potential to drive a wedge between ourselves and some of our most important diplomatic allies at a time when we have never had greater need of them. So that brings me to the second global challenge of the year. And ironically, it took an international public health emergency to get our mojo back following the disaster of the bushfire crisis. The performance of the superpowers in, in the COVID-19 pandemic was unimpressive. Both the United States and China have emerged diplomatically diminished from the global crisis. By contrast, smaller, more agile nations like our own have done much better. 
And the best way of looking at that is through some research that we conducted as part of the Lowy Institute uh, 2020 Asia Power Index. So I might see if I can share a slide with you now to see how the management of the pandemic resulted in um, in uh, improvements or deterioration in the international reputation of countries. So what you see in front of you is a chart that looks at management of the COVID-19 pandemic and um, the resulting uh, improvement or deterioration in the country's global or international reputation. This is based on a sampling of regional policymakers and of experts. Uh, so it's not just an Australian perspective on the world, it is a regional perspective. And what you can see is that the countries that were judged to be least effective at managing the COVID-19 pandemic also accrued the biggest deterioration in their international reputation. So the bottom left there, you see the United States, which was judged, judged to be the least effective um, at handling the, the COVID-19 pandemic and also registered the biggest deterioration in its international reputation. It was a massive loss of US prestige. On the top right quadrants, on the other hand, you see the countries that um, perform better in terms of their management of the crisis also registered the greatest um, reputational gains. Uh, and these tend to be smaller countries like Taiwan, like New Zealand, Vietnam, and Australia. The one big exception to that rule um, was China there in the lower right quadrant. China was judged to be effective in uh, handling the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, it was ruthlessly effective at suppressing the virus domestically. But the same authoritarian reflexes which allowed for that success um, created a degree of alarm globally, both in terms of the allegations that China may not have been forthright with information at critical early stages of the, of the crisis, but also the subsequent rise of wolf warrior diplomacy and the antagonization or the, uh, the resulting antagonism um, in terms of its relations uh, with a number of, of key countries, including Australia. So there you go. That's how the COVID-19 pandemic has shaped and reshaped uh, reputations of countries um, in the world. However, our success in managing the health challenge has also come at a steep price. We effectively, we effectively have had to cut ourselves off from the world and the long-term consequences of this uh, will be pronounced. Australia, for example, is one of the few advanced economies in the world to benefit from both high productivity and a growing working age population. This is the demographic Goldilocks zone, and there are very few other countries um, that uh, occupy that Goldilocks zone, the, the US being the other exception. And one of the sources of our growth in the working age population is migration, which is also a source of economic growth. And yet our net migration intake has declined to negative levels for the first time since the Second World War as a direct consequence of border closures from the pandemic. So dropping out of the demographic Goldilocks zone will have adverse implications for our fundamentals as a young and growing middle power. In fact, by some estimates, Australia is projected to be more than half a million people smaller in 2022 than would otherwise have been forecast in the absence of the pandemic. So the failure to, to reverse this trend in the first half of this decade would result in a smaller, poorer and ultimately less secure nation. That is something that we have to be incredibly mindful of. But as we take stock of the direct and indirect consequences of uh, COVID, it's worth reminding ourselves, firstly, how we got in this, in this situation. And I would argue it was the global politics of the pandemic, as much as the virus itself, that proved our collective undoing. COVID-19 was no black swan event. In fact, in September 2019, an expert panel convened by the, uh, convened by the World Health Organization and the World Bank warned of the very real threat of a global pandemic. And this was not the first warning. Presently, in that case, the experts noted that a lack of continued political will at all levels to prepare for a global pandemic um, would cost the world economy up to 4.8% of global GDP. That estimate looks to be pretty much bang on target when you look at the uh, economic fallout of the pandemic. The World Bank now estimates a 5.2% contraction in the global economy in 2020 as a direct result of the pandemic. And it begs the question, what went so catastrophically wrong? It's literally the stuff of novels and you have to go to some of the best novels to understand the failure in human behavior that took place. 
Few have written so vividly about the human condition in fevered times as did Albert Camus. The existential philosopher's 1947 novel La Peste tells the story of how townspeople in a French Algerian city faced up to a plague, both literal and allegorical. Camus' explorations of human uh, behavior, I would argue, are no less apt today. As in the novel, only now on a world scale, a disease burst forth from nature to mock our human pretenses. The coronavirus really held up a mirror to our societies, exposing their competing structures, their vulnerabilities and political priorities. Quite apart from the health emergency, COVID-19 unleashed a man-made pandemic of disinformation, of blame, of confrontation that tested globalization to its core. The West clearly struggled to come to terms with the challenge, certainly in the early stages of the pandemic. But I would argue if leaders in Europe and the United States were unprepared for what hit them, it is in part because they watched the epidemic grow with extraordinary indifference. And as Italy's death toll to the coronavirus overtook China's in March, the pendulum swung quickly from indifference to pandemonium. To use another uh, analogy, if this pandemic is given the logic of war, then it also surely cascaded into civil war. It was no longer a question of borders between countries, but within them and between individuals. And there was an unsettling symmetry, for example, between the US and China using the coronavirus as a geopolitical football and shoppers engaged in toilet paper brawls in shopping centers across the world. In other words, countries and people alike betrayed a zero sum understanding of the crisis. Now, in Australia, the general tone of politics changed under the weight of this emergency. We saw a gear shift in the response to the virus at an earlier point on the curve than in many other countries. And we were able to leverage both the good fortune of geography and good policy to produce results. It's critical now that we get our reaction right, not simply domestically, but also at the global level. At the global level. How do we salvage the situation regionally and in, global, uh, in terms of global institutions? This is a moment to reimagine our foreign policy, our foreign aid, and above all, how we invest in multilateral institutions. Cooperation on shared challenges has to coexist with competition and strategic rivalry in a divided world. Otherwise, like a contemporary Tower of Babel, globalization from which we have gained so much stands to collapse under the weight of its own complication. So now enter the elephant in the room and the third of the three pronged challenges of 2020, managing our China relationship. The principal effect of COVID-19 has been not so much to bend or to reshape history as it has to accelerate history. The things that were happening before the trends that were gathering storm only became more intense. The standout example from the Australian perspective was the near complete breakdown in our diplomatic ties with China. The deterioration in our bilateral relationship was essentially put on fast forward in 2020, culminating in Beijing imposing unprecedented sanctions and tariffs on key Australian export sectors. Here again, there's too much ground to cover um, in the time allotted for this lecture. So I will dwell on one of the principal lightning rods, which was the call by Australia's Foreign Minister Maurice Payne in April for an independent inquiry into the origins and handling of COVID-19. It's a useful case in point because it neatly encapsulates the fault lines in interpretation for how to deal with a nationalistic and abrasive China. Many see the flare up of trade tensions with China as proof that we pay too large and unnecessary a price for being among the first to push for an international investigation. For others, Beijing's economic retaliation vindicates the principle of standing up to a bully, alone if necessary, and of the futility of accommodating China's one-party state in any way. Despite their differences, what I would argue is that these warring schools of thought have in common a somewhat reductive worldview in which the sum of Australian foreign policy takes place either in a bilateral vacuum with China or at best in a fraught triangular relationship between Canberra, Beijing and Washington. The fact is, though, what happened at the World Assembly in May had little to do with either of the superpowers. Both Washington and Beijing wrote themselves out of global crisis leadership. And at the same time, Australia and the European Union successfully steered a resolution through the World Health Assembly calling for an independent review into the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. 
And they did so with the largest number of co-sponsors in the 17 year history of the World Health Organization and amid the most protracted great power standoff since the Cold War. So herein surely lies a foreign policy lesson. The government learned from its initial call from an inquiry that there was little to be gained in throwing rocks solo into the international arena. After flirting with the Trump administration's all out assault on the WHO, Canberra t toned down the rhetoric and reassessed its position. And in my opinion, the initial controversy has gone too far in obscuring what was subsequently achieved. The end result remains one of Australia's standout dip diplomatic tri triumphs of 2020. While a US blame game undercut the world's reasonable case against China's handling of the pandemic, Australia sponsored a proactive resolution and built international support behind it. The review promises to examine both the origins of COVID-19 and the role of the WHO. The global health body's handling of the pandemic is open to scrutiny, but the organization's centrality to global health policy has not been undermined. And I think that was a key achievement. The Independent Panel for Pandemic Pre Preparedness and Response will give us a first draft of the history of the COVID-19 virus with a substantive report due in May 2021. But while we await those results, we can already be sure of three things. First, the vote that took place in May illustrates that when they work together, middle powers can forge global consensus, even in a contested and dislocated international system. Secondly, and I think this is important for Australia, it shows it's possible to influence uh, Beijing's behavior when we have strength in numbers. China's eventual accession to the motion was not a fait accompli from the outset, to the contrary, Beijing chose on the eve of the resolution carrying to be among the last countries to sign on. To oppose the motion would have been a bad look and bound to fail. So in having succeeded in getting the review across the line, we proved to ourselves that the China challenge, while significant, is not one Australia need always face alone or yet so severe that it must subsume all our global interests. Sure, we had the help of others. The EU has heft in the international system and was crucial to achieving what we did. But Australia is nimbler and moves more easily in its relations with Asia. We use these complementary advantages to the best possible effect and for the broader global good. And similarly, I think as, uh, the same logic has to apply in our own region. Canberra should prioritize an outward looking and ambitious Indo-Pacific Indo strategy rather than risk withdrawing into a pessimistic and defensive posture vis-a-vis -vis China. Our strategic circumstances, while critical, are also dynamic. Australia was uh, one of only three countries to defy a race at the bottom and improve its regional standing in the Lowy Institute 2020 Asia Power Index. The two others to do so were fellow middle powers, Vietnam and Taiwan. While they're all very different countries, the performance of these three powers illustrate in their own ways how the future is likely to, to be defined by something I'm calling asymmetric multipolarity. It's a very heavy term, but let me explain what I mean. When neither the United States nor China can uh, establish undisputed primacy in Asia, it's the actions, the choices, the interests of smaller players, of particularly of middle powers, that become more consequential. They make the marginal difference. In that sense, the pandemic creates an opportunity to rethink and step up our regional diplomacy. And this can be done by committing to a post-COVID-19 recovery strategy for Southeast Asia, in addition to aid efforts already underway in the South Pacific. And I would argue succeeding in our regional engagement will also require a clear differentiation in our objectives. Building a strategic and military counterweight to China with partnerships with countries like India, Japan and US on the one hand, and cooperating with a more diverse set of middle powers in shoring up the rules-based regional order on the other. And by this, I mean working with the ASEAN grouping. Because for all its flaws, ASEAN's multilateral architecture continues to provide the only viable, broad-based and suitably non-aligned alternative to a Sinocentric order in the Indo-Pacific. I would go so far as to say that ASEAN's emerging economic architecture may well prove to be the most consequential hedge against Beijing's asymmetric economic clout. So the goal then should be to help Southeast Asian countries maintain regional balance in the ways they do best by slowly weaving together a set of rules among diverse actors for the region's economic governance. 
one of the silver linings of 2020 has been ASEAN's successful conclusion of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This was a free trade agreement uh, established, concluded, despite the absence of both India and the United States. RCEP, now the world's largest FTA, is an example of the region's commitment to strengthening the economic rules-based order. And the success of homegrown multilateral initiatives, often in spite of the protectionist agendas of the major powers, will not only be crucial for post-COVID recovery efforts, but ultimately offers the most compelling answer to Beijing's preference for ad hoc bilateral economic diplomacy as seen in the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, you could argue that RCEP has done very little to prevent China from flexing its economic power, from using its bilateral trade as a tool of economic coercion against Australia, essentially to pursue geopolitical objectives. But breaking the spirit, if not the letter, of bilateral and, free, and regional free trade agreements does raise the stakes and the reputational cost for Beijing. In fact, you only have to go back as far as 2017, when Xi Jinping proudly positioned himself as the anti-Trump in Davos. He styled himself as the leader of a responsible great power that would uphold the rules-based trading system. But you can't have it both ways. Beijing wants to create a regional economic system based not on rules that apply to everyone, but on its political preferences and interests. And that is Australia's cautionary China lesson for the world. Now, Australia has appealed to the World Trade Organization over China's de to the decision to impose huge tariffs on Australian barley earlier this year. And I think that is the responsible, the logical, and the only appropriate way forward. Retaliating with a US-China style trade war would be counterproductive and a road to nowhere. But going to, the, the, to, going to the WTO is a big deal. Australia has only been an offensive litigator three times in the last 20 years and never on such an internationally significant case. This will be a test case for whether the PRC, whether China meets its very core obligations as a WTO member. And in many ways, the WTO ruling may well be the trade law equivalent of the case brought by the Philippines against China under the UN Convention of the Law of the Seas. That uh, case successfully challenged Beijing's nine dash line in the South China Sea. Um, and this has been an enduring reputational damage, uh, a source of enduring reputational damage for China since 2016. It exposes Beijing's actions for what they are, illegal under international law, making it that much harder for China to justify its actions as legitimate and exposing hypocrisy. Look, there's no question that managing the consequences of China's rise and its assertiveness is going to be the work of this generation. It goes far beyond uh, one WTO ruling. What we're living through can best be described as a Cold War with economic characteristics. But this one is different from the last one in almost every respect. It's far less rigid. We are operating in a world that is far more interdependent than um, certainly the last Cold War. And uh, it creates a great deal more gray space in terms of alignments and, and spheres of influence. There's going to be hedging, there's going to be deterrence, there's going to be active cooperation with China all happening at the same time. And we also have to accept that China's centrality in the regional economy will only become more entrenched as a result of the pandemic. In fact, China is the only major economy to rebound into positive economic growth in 2020. But we, can, but we have to keep in mind that China has its own set of internal problems and we can take some measure of comfort from the fact that China is not destined to dominate the world in some kind of unending process of economic growth. In fact, Beijing must contend with protracted problems of debt and of an aging population. And China's workforce is pro projected to decline by 177 million people from current levels to the mid-century point. This presages all manner of social and economic challenges to come. On top of which, China remains a political system that still spends more on projecting power inwards on internal security challenges than it does on projecting power outwards on military spending. And that continues to be a source of enduring weakness and detracts from China's foreign policy um, ambitions. In the short term, however, we will have to manage our expectations in two ways. First, we may not even have reached rock bottom yet in terms of our bilateral ties. 
We're likely to see further deterioration after a new law was passed last week, giving the federal government the power to cancel international agreements by state governments, local councils and public universities. If, as expected, Canberra uses this to cancel Victoria's agreement with China on the Belt and Road Initiative, Beijing may well decide to retaliate further. On top of which, um, Australia's public opinion on China will likely continue its steep decline. Now that's a bigger problem for China than it is ourselves as decision makers and analysts, but it does present some uh, challenges in its own rights in terms of trying to keep a cool head and not engage in tit for tat rhetorical flourishes with China's wolf warrior diplomats, which I would argue really lead us nowhere. So we will have to maintain a degree of composure in the way that we stand up to China. So let's try to wrap all of this up. And I think the single biggest lesson for 2020 has been that the ability to project ourselves globally and to pursue our interests abroad starts with our strength and vitality at home. It starts with our domestic uh, competence. Australia should be focused on the recovery, adaptation and resilience of its economy and broader society. Sure, we have to pursue trade diversification from China as a means of lessening our uh, dependencies on, on China and our vulnerabilities, but it's not the Alexa that it is often made to be. It will be part of the solution, but finding new export markets and building them uh, will take years, if not decades, uh, to accomplish. Which brings me full circle to where this conversation began. The resilience and the prestige and the power of countries in the 21st century rests increasingly on their capacity to manage problems such as pandemics, such as climate change, economic security, and sustainable year, uh, sustainable growth rather. This year, we've proven to do well at some of that, if not most of that, but we also have to take stock of where we fell short and how we can improve and what the linkages between these issues are. The economist Ross Garneau has compellingly laid out Australia's potential to be an economic superpower of the future post-carbon world. This is a path, a very promising path, to building greater economic and energy security, to sectoral diversification, and also to self-reliance. Australia's favourable geography gives the island continent the potential to become a leader in renewables. And in light of our difficulties with China, there is a strategic imperative at play here. An emerging climate race has the potential to generate the same kind of technological and soft power dividends once associated with the space race of the old Cold War. The climate race is the new space race. And one way of looking at that with one final slide um, is the following, uh, which is the race for renewable energy. What you can see is that for now, the gap between reality and expectations has never been greater. Australia trails even certain developing ec uh, economies, including there you see Vietnam with a fraction of its landmass for renewable energy generation. But we do have the potential and there are signs that we are beginning to catch up here. So this is a key frontier in terms of our, our ability to compete in the 21st century. When historians look back at 2020, they will see how the onset of a novel coronavirus rushed in a new global disorder in a race to the bottom between the great powers. But 2020 need not be an enduring turn of fortunes for Australia. And indeed, it has been a year of diplomatic achievement as well. Um, we can make our own luck in this world. We can also shape this post-pandemic world multilaterally in ways that allow for a degree of, st of stability, a degree of openness, a degree of prosperity even, and some measure of rules-based engagement, which may well be the most important thing we can do as a middle power. So let's not let a good crisis year go to waste. With that, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and touch wood, a very Happy New Year. Thank you. Well, again, uh, on behalf of the board and the members, uh, Hervé, thank you so much for a truly challenging task of uh, sharing with us your views of what's been a truly difficult, challenging and very unusual year. On behalf of the board, and the RUSI members. I'd like to wish all of our viewers a very pleasant, safe, festive season. And I'd like to just give a very brief preview of how we see 2021 opening up, if that's hopefully the, what we're able to do. 
uh, early in the forthcoming year. The Anzac Memorial, as we understand it, is not planning to open to the public earlier than February 2021. And even that date, of course, is subject to the medical advice and realities uh, of February. So on that uh, reality, the January uh, lecture will again be a virtually presented lecture. And uh, please watch our website. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank the role of Ken Broadhead, who is one of our board members who has put these programs together very significant programs for about the last six years or so doing an absolutely sterling job. We will continue our monthly lecture program and even when COVID uh, restrictions ease, we believe that we will try to produce an interesting mix of some people will come to the Anzac Memorial uh, Lecture Complex and, and, and uh, attend in person. But many of us, for a whole range of reasons, including timing, uh, will view electronically. So I hope that you will check the website. You will stay with us. We thank you very much for your support. We look forward to working with you in 2021. And again, at the risk of being repetitive, on behalf of the board, have a safe, happy and joyous Christmas and New Year and we hope to see you at an event in 2021. Thank you very much. Goodbye.